everybody. In Chapter 11, we are going to be looking at the psychology of modern terrorism. Um, we do have a great terrorism class here at the university if you're interested in learning more and looking at this at a more in-depth level. Um, federal law, the uh, when we define terrorism, the unlawful use of force or violence against persons or property to intimidate or coerce a government, the civilian population, or any segment thereof in further furtherance of political or social objective, objectives. Now, by the way, we have direct domestic terrorism and international. Domestic um, means that the terrorists operate entirely within the United States borders without any foreign influence, and then international terrorism, acts that are dangerous and harmful to human life and violate the, uh, the laws of the United States or any state under um, the direction of a foreign government or organization. So international terrorism can take place on the United States soil, like um, the events of 9-11, or they can take place overseas, but they're directed at our um, interest here in the United States. Now, classification of terrorist groups, the FBI classifies terrorists according to uh, their political leanings. Right-wing terrorists are extremist groups or individuals that generally adhere to some type of anti-government ideology or even a racist ideology and often engage in hate crimes and violence. Left-wing extremist groups, that de they, these develop to eliminate class distinctions uh, tend to be moderate groups, protest to promote social change, and extreme, extreme can vandalize or even bomb, generally not violent towards people. Special interest uh, extremist activities uh, revolve around one issue that they are passionate about, like anti-abortion groups. And then environmental groups um, would uh, engage in... Um, I'm sorry, environmental groups also fall under this category. So like um, Earth Liberation um, Frontier would be an example of that. And then we have nuclear, biological, or chemical terrorists. These are groups that use these agents like um, the underwear bomber, anthrax that we had here in the United States, the dirty bombs, um, some com sometimes called bioterrorists because they're using um, biological weapons um, as a means to, um, to attack or scare people. Now, terrorist typology, so um, the typology of individuals in groups is based on the individual motivation, and in most cases, the motivation applies to the whole group. Um, the rationally motivated terrorists consider goals of the organization and possible con consequences, typically do not engage in violence intent or intend to harm people. They just destroy property, buildings, the infrastructure, things like that. Psychologically motivated, these terrorists are driven by a sense of failure or inadequacy and often seek some type of revenge on um, either groups or other people. Um, individuals are attracted to uh, this type of group for the psychological benefits and collective identity. Uh, usually do have a correct charismatic leader, can also be a lone wolf, like uh, Ted Kaczynski, who was the Unabomber, if you're not familiar with that, who have strong feelings of social alienation, anger, and extreme anti-government feelings. And then we have the culturally motivated or driven by fear or damage to their way of life, belief system, heritage, religion, organization, or government. The Taliban would be an example of that type of group. All right, when we talk about um, followers and leaders of terrorist organizations, the average age is between 20 and 29. They tend to be male and unmarried. There is no evidence of having mental health issues and no evidence of personality disorders like antisocial personality disorder or substance abuse. They tend to, as a group, be very homogeneous, which means alike. Um, while they can, while there can be variation, members of terrorist organizations tend to be, again, young males that are unmarried who come from all social backgrounds and social classes. So why do they join uh, terrorist organizations? I mean, there are a lot of theories out there and everybody has their own motivation, but here are some of the things that they have found with research. Some people lack the social skills to modify at least some aspect of their social situation, which can lead um, to feelings of helplessness. By the way, that's what uh, learned helplessness is. It is um, a concept where people feel like they can't do anything to change their situation, so they stop trying, and that can cause reactive depression. 
So there's generally two response patterns when we feel like we can't, when we have learned helplessness or we feel like we can't change some aspect of our social situation. Number one is to approach or attack. Number two is to avoid and withdraw. Most people avoid and withdraw, but those who join an organization um, would take the approach attack. Those who take this approach uh, might join, join organizations and engage in terrorism as a way to feel like they are actually doing something to change their social situation. A lot of these people do have low self-esteem. They're looking for a sense of purpose in their life, a sense of self-worth, a sense of belonging. Um, they could also learn um, by, you know, through the social learning theory, which we've talked about previously, um, growing up in an area where you witness terrorism or exposed to it on a daily basis, um, you learn that that's part of a great um, part of life. Also, um, martyrdom, volunteering for suicide missions because they see it as a way to do something worthwhile, gain recognition, bring honor to the family or to their community. Um, rage, resentment towards outside groups, those who develop antisocial patterns early in life um, kind of funnel that anger and rage and aggression into groups or against um, groups, and that would be a motivation um, to join one of these organizations. Quest for significance, uh, motivation to join an organization or to engage in terrorist acts is um, in attaining what one culture views as significant, um, being recognized as someone who's important and meaningful and significant in your, um, in your culture. The quest can be activated by three events. Number one, a significant loss, literally meaning, you know, meaning losing someone or something or feeling like you have a loss of power or feeling disrespected, ostracized, that could motivate somebody to join an organization. Number two, threat of significant loss. This can include being rejected by the group if you don't do something like engage in a terrorist act. And three, opportunity for significant gain, increase in self-perception, self-esteem, status, and power. In other words, people join these groups because they feel disenchanted, they feel powerless, they feel as if somebody else is threatening their way of life and um, and they join these organizations as a means to feel like they are doing something, um, make them feel like they're doing something in response to that or to feel like they're getting some type of significance or, or recognition. Terror management theory motivation is intense fear of death and intense desire to achieve immortality. Um, they feel like the sacrifice and commitment to the group or the cause um, can be negative or positive, but most see it as positive. They construct and maintain cultural worldviews as a way of avoiding the anxiety and fear that comes from the knowledge that death is inevitable. It's a formulation for immortality. Um, explains why some people uh, join groups. Um, you know, back when um, when, when um, Al Qaeda was um, very powerful in um, some parts of the world and responsible for the events of 9-11 here, you know, there was this idea that if you engaged in that martyrdom, um, you know, flying a plane or driving a, um, you know, a truck with bombs in it, that um, on the other side of, uh, of, of life, this life, you would gain immortality on the other life. So it's belief that, um, that if you sacrifice here for the cause that you're going to get something better in the afterlife for that, that's what martyrdom is. Um, and that is, you know, the, the people that flew the planes into the buildings here on 9-11, that would be an example of martyrdom. Um, most are not depressed or otherwise suicidal. They believe that uh, that they are sacrificing for um, the good of their group, that they are gaining something in that martyrdom, honor to themselves, to their families. Most, uh, by the way, do engage in what are called fail-safe procedures. Um, these are uh, to ensure plans are carried out by terrorists, um, by these martyr uh, by these martyrs, um, like writing goodbye letters, taking care of family business, things like that. Those are kind of fail-safe procedures that um, will ensure that these martyrs will follow through with their suicidal terrorist plans.
So becoming a terrorist, it doesn't happen overnight. There is definitely a radicalization process that, uh, you know, is usually a fairly long process. So radicalization is defined as an individual's indoctrination or internalizing that belief system to fully embrace that group's ideology and mission. Um, it is typically a slow, gradual process for most people. Small groups of people engage in long periods of social interactions over time. They begin to adopt the beliefs and, ex and, and kind of internalize those belief systems in a psychological process that's called the risky shift. They may engage in modeling, uh, modeling the beliefs and behaviors of the more experienced members. Um, and again, the group, the benefits of this are people that don't feel soci socially isolated, feel like their way of life is being threatened. They feel like they are now part of something that is um, taking steps to ensure that, or to attempt to ensure that their uh, way of life will not be um, will not be endangered uh, any further. Now, a cognitive construct. Uh, remember when we talk about cognition, we are talking about thinking. So there's definitely some thinking patterns that take place. Um, an adopted worldview, and this is really again internalizing the belief system of the group leaders of the organization. Um, the members, remember the age group is generally between 20 to 29, that's fairly young. They're young, they're naive, they're idealistic. Um, they don't have a lot of uh, cognitive complexity. They're looking at kind of very black and white ideas that um, we are right, they're wrong. Our beliefs are right, their beliefs are wrong. So there's kind of a, a very kind of a simplistic view that allows people to join these groups and engage in these kind of uh, behaviors. Now, when we talk about leaders of terrorist organizations, they tend to be very charismatic. They're seen as being uh, profound, important, significant, um, you know, within their culture or their group or their organization. They have a strong hierarchy, most of them, uh, with a chain of command and obedience to authority figures is expected and strictly enforced. And, and even some have kind of a military type of organization with, um, you know, lieutenants and captains and things like that. Al-Qaeda would be an example of that where, uh, you know, there's definitely one leader, bin Laden, but um, they had um captains and uh and other leaders in the organization that the terminology was very similar to what we would hear in um in military organizations so larger terrorist organizations like something like al-qaeda um, they tend to be uh, very complex in their organizational structure it, they tend to be also um, complex in that they are spread over multiple locations. Al-Qaeda was a great example of that. Um, Bin Laden had multiple independent um, groups that were spread out all over the world, um, networks and cells even here in the United States. So um, uh, very complex. Terrorist, uh, terrorists, by the way, um, have changed. When we think about ISIS right now, uh, ISIS doesn't seem to have like a single char charismatic figure and a, a strong hierarchy that we can kind of um, identify and follow. So terrorist also terrorism also changes as as it evolves and changes. Now when it comes to lone wolf terrorist, and that just means somebody that is acting alone. Um, all terrorists use new forms of communication, by the way, not just lone wolf terrorists, but even large uh, terrorist organizations. Uh, most terrorist attacks in the United States um, have come from lone wolf terrorists. That means people that are acting alone, but we've certainly had a history of, um, of attacks here in the United States that were done by international terrorists like 9-11 or the World Trade Center bombing before 9-11. Uh, they do use now social media 
and the internet for recruitment, and also on how to um, create and manufacture weapons as well. Now, when it comes to lone wolf, wolf terrorists, and so we're talking now about people that are acting on their own and not really uh, with other people, like a large group. So it could be one person like Ted Kaczynski, or um, it could be a couple of people like those who are responsible for the Oklahoma bombing. Um, the main characteristics of lone wolf terrorist is um, most terrorist attacks in the United States are lone wolf attacks generated by one or two people as opposed to large groups like 9-11. So Oklahoma bombing, you can hear it, see it's here, it's talking about the Boston Marathon bombers. Um, lone wolves tend to be psychologically different than members of those larger or organizations. Uh, their beliefs are based on their own interpretation of the world and their perceived wrongs and injustice. Is, uh, most lone wolf terrorists, not all, but most, uh, tend to have mental health issues. The Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, who I mentioned earlier, um, if you're not familiar with him, he mailed bombs over a 17-year uh, period to various organizations and universities, killing three people and injuring 23. His motivation was to bring attention to what he saw as social problems with government and technology. And it has been suggested that he was mentally ill and probably schizophrenic, but he took a plea deal, so we don't actually know that. The Fort Hood shooter uh, in 2009 killed 13 and wounded 30, said his shooting was to protect Muslim Muslim and Taliban leaders. The Boston Marathon, this was in April of 2013. Uh, there were two uh, bombs, uh, killed three, injured 264. That was two brothers who said the motivation was retribution for U.S. military action in Afghanistan or Iraq. Although they were not directly connected to any terrorist organizations, they became self-radicalized um, and used those internet sources to acquire a uh, uh, terrorist philosophical beliefs and propaganda, along with, um, you know, you can find on the internet how to build bombs. Um, so they also find technology on how to engage in, um, in those, uh, in th that case, in building bombs. The Fort uh, Sh Hood shooter that was um, in Texas, a former doctor said to have PTSD. Again, no overseas ties or networks. He was actually in the U.S. military and became self-radicalized after being deployed overseas. So the main characteristics of lone wolf terrorist, uh, and again, most of the history of terrorist uh, terrorism on United States soil has been with lone wolf terrorists. They tend to operate individually or with one other person. They do not belong to organized terrorist groups. They act without direct influence. They may claim to be acting on behalf of an interest group. Their attacks are premeditated, carefully planned, um, more likely than other terrorists to be emotionally disturbed, and they do demonstrate poor interpersonal and social skills. All right, the psychosocial context of terrorism. The social and psychological circumstances that encourage certain behaviors to develop and expand. Um, one is cultural uh, devaluation. So, um, Irvin Straub in 2004 suggested certain cultural characteristics are conducive to the development of uh, terrorist groups. So, this cultural devaluation contributes. It is the process by which one group or culture is selected by another group or culture as the enemy. Uh, we are good, they're bad. We're right, they're wrong. Um, and this causes. Uh, perceived harm or actual harm, actual harm. Uh, so it becomes like a cultural scapegoat, if you will. It is widely believed that many groups view the United States this way because of our power, our wealth, um, and it allows them to view the United States as the ideological enemy. Um, subculture component um, are the perceived inequalities uh, relative deprivation and injustice subcultures often feel this makes disadvantaged, powerless, uh, shunned groups and people at risk for terrorism. That's the second characteristic. And the third is most terrorist groups, uh, terrorist groups have a strong hierarchy with often charismatic leaders, which attract people um, with a strong respect for authority who, who need or who want um, authority. All right. Um, 
motives and justifications. There's something called cognitive restructuring that really allows for moral justification of behavior. Albert Bandura of social learning theory attempted to explain motives and justifications into the cognitive realm thinking. He suggests they can justify their horrific acts through cognitive restructuring, which is a psychological process that involves moral justification, euphemistic language, uh, advantageous comparisons, et cetera. People engage in these um, acts, but they tell themselves their, their acts are socially worthy, that, um, that what they're doing is moral, it has a good purpose, there's a reason behind it. So they're able to kind of uh, justify their behavior in their brain. Euphemistic language, language shapes uh, thoughts and patterns on which people may um, uh, may uh, may allow them to justify their actions. So it can, we know that language can kind of shape our thought patterns, but Bandura suggested that using neutral words and phrases allow people to feel better about their actions. So like collateral damage, uh, waste uh, people instead of kill, uh, serving the target instead of bombing or shooting or blowing up. So just using language that uh, kind of morally justifies behavior. Um, advantageous a comparison. Terrorists are truly convinced their group or culture is superior, and when they believe the enemy is cruel, unjust, or a threat to their group or culture, um, again, they're allowed to kind of morally and cognitively justify their behavior. Additional disengagement practices that allows people to engage in this type of behavior Diffusion of responsibility. Everyone plays some small role, allowing no one person to feel responsible. So this is why you often see uh, with large terrorist organizations, they have multiple people on, for example, in 9-11 on planes. So no one person is responsible. We have a diffusement of responsibility. Dehumanization. It's easier to kill strangers who are uh, void of human characteristics or who uh, who are defined as the enemy or evil. Uh, De-individuation, losing a sense of one's individuality and identifying with the group instead. So all of those kind of psychological processes allow uh, people that engage in this type of um, violence towards other people to justify their behavior as being moral. All right, this was a little bit uh, shorter of a chapter. There are a couple of interesting articles online, um, so make sure you take a look at that. There's a, a link to the FBI terrorist page and a link to an article on psychology of terrorism. Um, if you have any questions or concerns about anything in this chapter, let me know. Otherwise, have a great rest of the day.